I mean, what's pro football focus doing? Last week they had Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. As a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PFL. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. We're going team by team. I would be very careful about it. Am I going to get sued? Are we going to legal on this? Let's send, send you out on the right now. PFF sucks. Have a great, great, great. great. <laughs> Welcome into the PFF NFL podcast, Steve Pelzola, Sam Monson, live on YouTube. I'm not sure that countdown was accurate. Yeah, I think the countdown may have been off. Yeah. They may have caught me a little bit. <laughs> All right, we got Chris Sims waiting, so we're going to get right into it. Is 2024 bringing exciting or unexpected changes to your life? Well, here's a secret weapon to help you face those challenges with more confidence. It's a great term life insurance policy. That's right. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it simple to protect your family's financial future so you can focus on what's ahead knowing your family is protected if something else unexpected happens. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. And Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family your budget like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you it's all online and on your schedule you can go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required so join the thousands of pa- parents who f- trust fabric to protect their family apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash pff nfl that's meetfabric.com slash pff nfl m-e-e-t fabric.com slash pff nfl policies issued by western southern life insurance company not available in certain states prices subject to underwriting and health questions sam Steve? We have Chris Sims on the line. Let's go. We told you we'd get him. Welcome in, Chris. What's up, guys? How are you? Good good to see you. Uh, really impressive, Steve. I mean, damn, that was a good ad read. I'll give you credit there. <laughs> Thank right? you. And it did occur to me. It, did occur, it occurred to me in the opening, which I knew already, but you guys are probably right up there with me as far as people throwing shots at you, not agreeing of evaluations. You probably deal with about as much crap as I do a lot of the time. Just so. among our own fans. Forget and forget everybody else. <laughs> right, like right. Half the people listening to the show hate us. <laughs> no, we uh, – yes, we do. There, there's a lot. So we like to lean into that. We have fun. You know, you know, and so you, you always have bold takes, right? You don't go with the – the group think, and, and that's what we like and respect about you. So let's let's start with that. With your with uh, we'll start with QBs in a minute. But with your rankings generally, how do you go about it? How do you come to your top fives and everything that you've been putting out on the Unbuttoned podcast? Right. Yeah. I mean, I just I do it. You know, straight through work. Right. I mean, just like you guys do, evaluating film and and writing notes to myself and trying to gauge and compare and you know, ooh, nitpicky. What what do I value more and all that. What I do do is, of course, I mean, I follow lists like that PFF puts out, right, of top people at each position. I definitely do that. My, my, probably my fail safe, and, and the good thing is, I have some friends in the NFL, as you guys would imagine. And what I do ask from them a little bit at times is like, hey, you know, I don't need to know the grades. I don't need to know your grades. I don't care about your grades, but can, can I get like alphabetical order top 20 at each position, right? And I got a few different teams lists, right, that I look at. And usually, if you got a top 20 at each position, 17 or 18 of the names are pretty much the same. And then there's a few extra guys that might be on one team's list that's not on the other team's list and so on. But that's kind of how I dig through it. And, you know, I'm old school like you guys. I sit in front of the TV or the computer and I just dig through film and and you know i enjoy that process and do you actually have a kind of um you know an empirical grading system or when you do the rankings is it all kind of gut feel like this guy's better than this guy and just put them together yeah no i don't have like a precise grading system like you guys have right i I don't have that what i do have is you know uh, friends in the scouting community, a background in it a little bit to where I know how things are graded and what I should value. And that was my time in New England. That was very, very valuable for me from that standpoint. But no, Sam, I'm more along the lines of like, you know, as I go through a position, I kind of keep a list as I go. Right. So if I watch seven quarterbacks on the day, you know, okay, I watch seven, I kind of write down, all right, these are my two or three favorites from this day and kind of keep that list running and going, I get done, and then I kind of go back and go, okay, what? Are, who did I like? What did I like? Let me watch them again and now nitpick and see how I'm going to figure out as far as how I want to grade this or or rank, uh, you know, who in front of who. And that's kind of really my process. 
All right, well, let's get into the into the quarterbacks, the position that you played. By the way, I was just uh, watching, because I watch old drafts just for fun, the 2003 NFL draft. Any uh, <laughs> any memories from uh, Gosh, what is, no, what's relevant None of them are that mind. good, um, <laughs> that, honestly, which is weird, right? Because it's such a great day. You get in the NFL, right? But it's about your expectations, where you think you might go, right? I was kind of this guy that was – fringe end of the first round conversation right had some teams that led me to believe that they might take me there right but i kind of had this like senior year of wow he can't win the big game we kept losing to oklahoma and you know as you know i mean it's still true like once you don't go in the first round as a quarterback you don't see second round quarterbacks a lot right it usually ends up wait it's the third it's the fourth round and I sat there for, you know, a long time that first day when the first three rounds were all on day one uh, and finally got the call from John Gruden where I was pissed as hell and happy as hell at the same time. It's a, it's a weird emotion trying to explain that. Don't, don't worry. I was draft eligible in baseball for three different years. That's how it goes. I was, I, I was passed over uh, 4,500 times. There's 1,500 picks in each. So don't worry about it, Chris. Look at us now. Okay. Look at us now. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're quarterbacks, and, and so you, you tier them, which I like. You know, it's not just a one – you know, it's a, it's a ranking, but you like to tier them. And so you, you've got Caleb Williams in a class of his own. Uh, what do you like about Caleb Williams and, you know, any, any concerns with him at the next level? No, I, I mean, my only, the only concern just to start there would be, hey, I mean, you know, again, he's he's a magic man, right? It's taking care of the football, taking chances, right? You know, throwing a ball while he's running to the left, you know, across the field 25 yards and going, wait, I got away with that in high school and college. And you go, I don't know if you're going to get away with that in the NFL, right? So finding that fine line of aggressive and reckless, I think that would be my biggest concern with Caleb Williams. But I mean, I think as you guys could tell by my rankings and, you know, I don't think you guys are much different. I, I think he's a big time, awesome football player, right? Uh, it, it's a year in where I think in a lot of years, Jaden Daniels would be the number one quarterback, but Caleb Williams is just so special in so many ways. One, he's a slam dunk thrower. We know how powerful his arm is, right? He's got the most arm angles we've seen out of anybody. I think maybe ever coming out of college football. I think that's the Mahomes effect. I do think he's very good in the pocket. He sees the field well. And then he's an incredible scrambler, right? You know, an, an extender of the play, scramble to make a throw. He's special that way. So there's not a lot that I didn't like about Caleb Williams. I found him to be one of the more cleaner guys I've ever evaluated and one of the more exciting guys I ever evaluated coming out in the draft. So we, we were saying that this year's draft seems
You guys got me? Yep. Sorry, Chris. That's all right. I was like, I was like, damn, I've never had this happen in my house. I don't know what happened. And then I was trying to get on and I couldn't. It was saying I was a host. That's when I started to realize something was wrong with you guys. I was like, wait, something's down. Are we back live, guys? I don't know. All right, we're back. So, sorry. So, I'm blaming Chris. We're going to blame Chris oh, okay, for this. Cool. It's Chris. Did he pay the internet bill? The internet went out. And uh, but we're back here. You mean Chris Collins? Collinsworth, right? not Sims. Oh, about. I see. You're not talking. I was about cool. Me. No, He's Chris Sims. Chris no H. Oh, I guess. Chris with Got no it. H. It's all Collinsworth. <laughs> as long as somebody else is at fault, not us. I'm fine. Your NBC coworker, Chris yeah. Sims. So we were we were hitting on Caleb Williams. I don't know if you want to go back to that. I know I got cut off or didn't hear you guys when Sam kind of started in on. Hey, the thing about this year's draft class, and then it cut out. So yeah. I didn't get to hear you finish that thought, Sam. So I was going to say, everyone seems more or less on the same page about most guys. And what we like about you every year is that you tend to be different. And a couple of places, I think, where you are significantly different. We'll get to the receivers in a minute, but one of them is Drake May. Um, and actually, it's not just you on this Drake May thing, but the longer we go, the more people seem to have soured on Drake May. Why do you have him? You have him QB six, right? In your third yeah. tier, tier That's four, right. talented Fourth project. Tier. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of how I view him, right? It, it's a, there's things he's got to work on. Now, listen, I love the the prototype size, right? He is a he is a good athlete. There's no doubt about that. He can run, right? I do like the way he moves and all that as well. But I think my biggest thing, and like as I sit here and just you know go through my notes and all that, right? Like. I like his feet, but I don't like his base. It gets way too narrow, right? He needs room to throw the football, right? Where like a guy like Caleb or or Jaden Daniels could just stand there with the pocket collapsing and still make throws and not have to step into it or crow hop into it or do anything like that, right? So there's that. There's some mechanical issues, Sam, that, that scare me that I'm not sure that I just feel like, oh, they'll definitely get fixed, right? It can the, the 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 motion itself can be segmented a little bit at times, and what I mean by that is like it has one part, and then it goes to another part, and then it goes to another part instead of just flowing and being fluid and looking natural. Right? There's a a front step where he points his toe at the target, and his front leg locks out. That is not usually a recipe for being a successful, accurate passer. Right? So you see some of the highlight throws, and you go, "Wow." That's a, that's a great throw, and that's there, right? But I'm not sure you're going to be able to tap into that and make it consistent. That's what scares me. There is way more off-target throws than I was expecting when watching him, and enough off-target throws to where I go, wait, this is, this is more than just like, oh, he missed this guy, he missed that guy, he's still awesome, and I feel good about it. It's it's egregious at times where I just go, whoa, you missed the throw, and it looked like that. Or some of the completions where I go, man, he's wide open. You hit him in the chest, he's going to run for 50 yards, and the guy has to go down to the ground or turn around. So the ball is just everywhere, and I've never seen a really great quarterback have a college film or a throw, or throw it or a pro day like he did where they lose control of the ball as much as Drake may. And that, that's what concerns me, guys. I think the statement that you were mocking is what I said when I was watching him. <laughs> the state, because there's like, there's, there's a lot of bad stuff on there. And like my, my 2022 notes are similar. I'm like, anytime he tries to reset his feet, it's inaccurate. He's got to hit his layups, you know, deep balls kind of flat. Yes. I've got all these negatives. And then at the end of it, I'm like, yeah, he's still an awesome quarterback prospect. It's okay. So if you had Drake May, is he a sit for a year type of guy? And do you think even sit? I know Jordan Love just came out of this, but do you think sitting, you know, is that is that environment even conducive to maybe fixing some of these issues? I'm I, Yeah, I'm not usually a guy that's like sit, right? I'm usually, hey, play, get him out there. But I think this is one young, hasn't played a lot, does have mechanical issues, has some of the issues you talked about, right? Even from the mental standpoint, you watch him on film, there's times where I'm like, I'm not sure exactly if he knows where he's being blitzed, where he should be looking at according to the coverage, right? And that, you know, your other point too, hey, the NFL, you guys know, especially for top draft picks, I mean, your life is moving around the pocket. You don't have a good offensive line. You're on a bad team, and now I got to make a good throw, right? And 
those are things that he does not thrive well in, uh, no doubt about it. So, yeah, I mean, I see some of that high-end talent, and I hear people go, oh, it's like Josh Allen or Justin Herbert, and I just go, uh, it's not to me. They didn't lose control of the football the way this guy does. And Josh Allen, hey, he had plays where you go, what is he doing? But I never went, oh, he lost control of the football. I went, why is he trying to squeeze that ball in between three people and throw it 155 <laughs> miles per hour, right? right? There's a difference there to me. And that's what scares me a little bit about Drake May. And you and your dad, I remember, were big Josh Allen guys coming out, right? You loved the tools, the arm strength. Obviously, he's turned out to be an absolute superstar and cleaned up some of his issues coming out. So, Definitely. So you don't right. like when you – because, and, and I think you liked Herbert coming out too? I so, did. I liked yeah. Herbert a lot. I mean, I had Burrow won Herbert too, yeah. right, in the year of Tua and Jordan Love there, right? Right. So, I mean, you, you've been pretty good as far as identifying the, the big arm, you know, arm talent type of guys who have been able to develop, and you're not putting Drake May necessarily into that same category. No, no, I'm not. Yeah, it's just that there's, there's a few too many in that, you know, the box over here where I go, ooh, this scares me, this scares me, this scares me, this needs work to where, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not against saying he's a first-round draft pick. I get that. But when I hear – when I hear, right, I hear people say the things you say and then go, he's the number three pick of the draft. And I want to go, wait, rewind that. You just said that and you think he's the number three pick of the draft? Are you sure you just heard what came out of your mouth? Yeah. Right. So that's where, uh, you know, there's a few things there that I'm just not sure about or comfortable with it. Added to the fact of, you know, I think has probably the longest release of all the guys in the draft that we're talking about, you know, the main guys, the top five or six here. Right, I thought not only does he need the most space, but I thought he had the slowest release maybe out of everybody in the whole thing as well. So, yeah, he is to me a project, and I would like to see him uh, ultimately sit a year you know, if not two years before he's ready to go and, and, you know, hitting on all cylinders. When I really got into Drake May's tape for the first time, the thing that jumped to mind was that um, Brad Pitt Moneyball meme, the if he's a good hitter, why doesn't he hit good? Like that that's Drake May, right? If he's this good, why I, isn't he this good? Like where where is it? Exactly. That's a it's a great way to say it, right? I think it right now it's a little bit of like um hey, I think a lot of the media and the draft experts, and again, I'm not trying to sit here on a high horse and tell you I'm always right. I've certainly had my swings and misses. I know that, right? I'm I'm the guy that put Zach uh, Wilson in front of Trevor Lawrence, right? So I know I'm not perfect. This is not a perfect business. But I do feel like with this one, it's a little bit of like, wait, we had him ranked here two years ago, and we don't want to let that down. And then he looks like the prototype, so we're just going to keep riding this no matter what. And I, you know, I think you guys are seeing it the same way I do. When you unpack it, it's just it's not as you know flattering as you expect the film to be with Drake May. The, the one last thing on May, though, the reason why I do like him though is the way he, the way he throws to the middle of the field. I I know some of the I had an offensive or offensive coach say to me, hey, he's throwing to number three, the inside receiver in trips with option routes over the middle of the field, easy, one of the easiest routes to throw. But I feel like throwing to the middle of the field, Mays, touch, accuracy, I've seen him layered. I, I feel like that's some of the best I've ever seen in college. That's what I like about him, but certainly have sure. some of the same concerns that you have as far as the consistency footwork and some of the stuff that needs yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah, it's that. And, and I, I see some of those throws too, but I hear it. He's big, and he can stand in there and throw it over the line, right, and and be like, oh, he can see everything. He's good, right? But even with that, like to your point, there was throws where I went, wow, okay, that was a nice throw. That was the right way to do it. But then there was more throws where I went, wait, that's not the appropriate throw for that coverage and where that guy's running. Like, why did he do that? Or, whoa, he didn't even give the guy a chance. And we'll see. You know, again, I don't I, – I, that's my evaluation. I'm rooting for the kid. I hope he proves me wrong. It's nothing personal like that. But, yeah, I got some, uh, some big questions about his game. So we have to talk wide receivers. Um, I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had with Malik Neighbors versus Marvin Harrison at the top of this draft. But right. you have Brian Thomas Jr., the other LSU receiver, above Marvin Harrison Jr. And – as much as I Go love, ahead, say it. You I think love, it's crazy. You think it's crazy. I love <laughs> divergent opinions and out there individual takes, but this feels crazy. Justify this to me. Well, you know, listen, Brian Thomas, sure, there's a little bit of a projection involved there, right? Um, I could be a little bit like you talked about with the quarterbacks where 
I'm a sucker for the strong arm guy and all that, right? I don't let it go so far out of the way where I'm just like, well, I think Anthony Richardson's better than C.J. Stroud because his arm's better, right? Right. But, you know, like to that point, yeah, I fall in love with explosiveness, speed, the the specimen of the guy maybe a little bit more, right, than some of the guys out there. I, I want to make this clear. I really like Marvin Harrison Jr., right? I think he's one of the safer picks in the draft. I know that for sure. Right. But with like Malik neighbors, one, I'm blown away by Malik neighbors. I think he's pretty damn special. Uh, I do. I I just look at route running explosiveness, what he does after the catch. Right. Even though he's not as big as Marvin Harrison, he is good at catching balls in traffic and 50, 50 balls and jumping up and getting it that way. Right. But I think it's really more of like Brian Thomas's top end talent and his playmaking ability and ability to separate as compared to Marvin Harrison, where, he runs good routes, but I'm not like, wow, he knows how to attack coverage and leverage, but I'm not like, oh, wow, the physical specimen is just going to pull away from, I think, top-tier corners all the time on a regular basis. And I guess I value that maybe a little bit more than you or some others out there. And Again, I'm not saying I'm right, but uh, yeah, Brian Thomas Jr., I looked at Sam in a lot of ways and went, man, I feel like I'm watching an A.J. Brownish type of guy. It's not an extensive route tree, a lot like A.J. Brown at Ole Miss and all that. You don't get to see it all. But, man, I just really like the physical tools, I thought, that he brought to the table. The the Brian Thomas one is interesting because he's the receiver this year where certainly I and Steve, to a slightly lesser degree, are lower on him than the consensus. Now, you're higher on him than the consensus. But, like, he's sort of consensus wide receiver four right now, I think, for most people. We have him much lower. To me – he feels a lot more limited, I think, than you're describing. And I kind of comped him to this Marquez Valdez-Scantling type of receiver at a time when the league is almost moving away from those guys because of all this too high coverage shell and the, the sort of taking away of explosives by defense. And I'm wondering, like, how much more he can do against NFL defenses. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Now, listen, he's a lot bigger than Marquez Valdez-Scantling, right? You know, I think what he does after the catch is kind of special that way let alone like hey i'm big on like let's first start it out where let's just line you up here and let's see if you can get open against people all day long right and that to me is where he shines now he doesn't run a ton of routes but damn he runs by everybody right that's the thing i love and then like listen i know the route running and we didn't but like i this is where again my evaluation trying to piece things together Right. I I look at it and go, I think he's got the tools to be a good route runner. Right. And every bit is good or even maybe even better than Marvin Harrison Jr. Like I'm not super impressed with Marvin Harrison Jr.'s ability to just stick a foot in the ground and explode out of that break and pull away from people. To me, Brian Thomas was better in that area. Now, does he know to attack leverage? Is he quite as nuanced as Marvin Harrison Jr.? No. And that's where Marvin Harrison Jr. is really good. But, like, I almost feel more comfortable with Marvin Harrison Jr. almost as a big slot rather than, oh, wait, I'm going to put him out here and I know he'll get open against the number one corners in football week after week after week. Uh, That's where I'm just not sure. And that's where I think I'm probably a little lower on Marvin Harrison than than most, to to your point, Sam. When you turned on Marvin Harrison's tape, did you say – I'm watching Neighbors and how explosive he is, and Brian Thomas is creating all these big plays, and Roma Dunze looks really athletic. And did you feel like Harrison, who didn't run, right? He doesn't have this 4-4 on right. film, which plays in your brain a little bit. It's like, oh, he doesn't feel fast, but I know he runs 4-4, so I'm okay. Does any of that play in where he, did, he didn't, doesn't look as explosive as some of those other guys, but he is better as far as the nuance goes, as you say? Yeah, I, I try not to let, hey, he didn't run the 40 or any of that influence me and bias. You know, I don't want to do that. I, I try to go by, you know, the film and, and, and look at it that way. I think to your point, like on film, I don't know how you guys felt, but I, I would have probably said, yeah, he's a high 4-4 if I had to evaluate it from the way he plays, right? 4-4-8, 4 4 something along uh, those, those lines there. And, you know, that's where, you know, yes, I did not love his game in that way. But, like, do I think he's got incredible hands? He's got size, right? He knows how to play the ball, adjust to the ball, catch the ball in traffic, right? Tough over the middle. Yes, he can do all of that, right? So I, that's where I think I'm a little different is where I almost look at him as like a, 
Michael Thomas, right? Almost that kind of ish player rather than, wait, he's just going to go outside and be Justin Jefferson or A.J. Brown or Tyree Kill, and we can just go, go gadget speed and I'll get open all day long. And that's where I think I just differ on that is where I kind of look at him in that way. I think Brian Thomas Jr. has a chance or in my eyes is going to be that guy you can put on the outside and go, whoa, he caught a slant. He ran for 50 and a touchdown. You know, whoa, he caught a slant. He broke a tackle and got another 20 yards uh, pulling away from people. And that's where he excites me. I think that's an element that Marvin Harrison Jr. doesn't have. Uh, but I know it, it's 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 nitpicky. It's close. And I, I do want to make sure I like Marvin Harrison Jr. I really do. Do you think that him or his sort of representation actually made a mistake with that whole we're not going to work out we're not going to put the numbers out there because that makes sense it, like the, the narrative was sort of every, nobody has questions about that so marvin harrison doesn't need to work out right everyone everyone right. has what they already want on the tape but all of a sudden it is being compared to malik neighbors and brian thomas jr and those guys have the numbers there and now we are sort of saying does Marvin Harrison actually have that? Whereas, you know, some tracking data says that he's got blazing speed. Like, if he'd actually gone out there and run a 4-4 flat, half of this goes away. Not necessarily from I you, so. but from a lot yeah. of other people. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think that would have, you know, eased the pain of some guy or people, right? They're like, oh, I'm just not sure how explosive it is, right? I think that, that would have gone a long way. But I also understand, like, his take on that wait i'm the number one guy right. everybody thinks i'm the number one guy and when you are that guy right a lot of the times you feel like no matter what you do it's not going to be good enough and people are going to kind of pick it apart and maybe drop you so I, I don't fault him for his decision but yeah he's gotten stuck in a little position where yeah people like me like brian thomas jr you're like you're saying i think the nfl looks at brian thomas jr and maybe views him a little higher than all the draft pundits out there and all that right and I, I mean, I think you guys know as long as, and I know as well, and I know, you know, I don't know everybody in football, but there's definitely a, a handful of teams that have a, you know, a for sure better grade on Malik Neighbors than Marvin Harrison Jr. And we'll see where that goes. To me, the Arizona team is going to be the interesting one, right? Because they need something. They got to make sure. And like we said, Marvin Harrison Jr. is a safe pick. Monty Austinfort's from New England. They usually like big receivers. I certainly could see him going there and them feeling comfortable with that, which I would like because then maybe my Giants will take neighbors at six. But, um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting uh, little discussion and, and see how this works out for the draft. Uh, let's talk corners a little bit. You have uh, – who do you like at the top? And then you have at least one different name. Like your top five, again, looks different than others as far as corner goes. Well, I'm in, I mean, I have a man crush on Quinion Mitchell, right? I, I mean, I've, I've loved him. I, I think he is, in, for my money, in the conversation for the best player in the draft, right? I, I think every bit up there with Dallas Turner of the world where, you know, Dallas Turner's awesome, but I think he's also a little bit of a projection specimen like what we're talking about too. With Quinion Mitchell, I think the only thing you talk about is just like, oh, I wish he would have played some higher-end receivers this last year so I can evaluate on that on film. But, man, explosive, aggressive, top-end speed, size to, you know, uh, you know, bump with big receivers down the field. And I thought his ability to play the ball, right, because I think he's got a uh, receiver background a little bit. You see that. He's not one of those guys, Sam, you know how, like, they always play the receiver and then just try to knock it out of their hands instead right. of looking back at the ball. He, like, looks at the ball and tries to make a play on it like a receiver. And I found that to be refreshing and awesome. And, uh, yeah, one of my – gave me shades of Devin Witherspoon from last year, except I think he's better pure cover guy, maybe not quite the kamikaze tackler, but still good in that department. <laughs> Devin Witherspoon. <laughs> Everybody loved watching Devin Witherspoon film last year. Do you have a corner? You got, what do you guys say? I don't know if I've seen your quarterback, quarterback rankings. Where are you guys at with, with Quinion Mitchell and your thoughts there? I, I mean, I think there's a big three for corners. I, I, corner, to me, feels a little bit like the receivers this year, where I think yeah. that, that big trio that everyone's talking about of Harrison, Neighbors, and Odunze, I sort of feel the same way with corner of uh, Terry and Arnold, um, Quinya Mitchell, as you said, and then Nate Wiggins is the other guy that I think is the, the third in that group. To me, there's a gap between those guys and the rest. Um, all three of those guys, I think, have that just sick coverage ability that you were talking about. The official PFF yeah. ranking by Trevor Sikama. Trevor loves Cooper DeGene. 
from Iowa. Absolutely mm. loves him, maybe more than any other person in the draft community. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, throw Kool-Aid McKinstry in there. I think all those guys are five first-rounders. I like I like all of them to some. some I like degree. them, too. The, the Bama guys are going to be interesting to me, right? You know, they're not my cup of tea. They're really good players, right? Like, I don't want to make this. I, I want them on my team. There's no doubt about that. But, again, I don't know great corners that run 4-5. That would just be my thing. Now, if you know you're going to play zone and they're going to be nickel cover corners, but my my problem with them is Nick Saban likes to play man-to-man, and he didn't like to play man-to-man with this group. And I think, you know, their pure explosive ability would scare me against top-tier NFL receivers. That's where, like, love them, know they're going to be good in the NFL, safe picks, but their pure explosive ability – is less than in my opinion. And that's where I, I worry about them a little bit. But I, I'm with you guys on Nate Wiggins. And of course, you know, we're, we're the same on Quinion Mitchell there. So the name that you have that I haven't seen anywhere else among like a top five is DJ James from Auburn. So sell us on DJ. Yeah, I, I love, I mean, one, I'm, I'm big into, again, you know, man to man, he covers this guy. He takes the best receiver in big moments, right? This is one where, like, when I got done, I was like, wait, am I crazy here? I actually text names to Devin McCourty, who I work with at NBC, and a few other people in the NFL, and I, I got positive feedback, right? But, uh, again, that's where I would favor him over the Alabama guys. I get to see him against neighbors and some of these other top-tier receivers. And when it's a big moment or a big play, they play man-to-man. Now, I wish he was a hair faster altogether but man the looseness of his hips his ability to change directions his acceleration out of changing direction or out of transition like we talk about i thought was top notch uh i really like dj james and um yeah i'm a little bit more basis on that like you know it's got to start with man to man and can you play man to man and do that right because i feel like that's a skill that's not always coachable the other stuff is coachable and that's probably where I, you know, I'm a little different than, than some on the uh, cornerback stuff. James is currently 107th on the consensus draft board. He's been as high as 54, but um, our numbers do like him. I mean, I think if you got him, I mean, if he is available in the third or fourth round, I think that's an absolute value pick for sure. And, uh, you know, again, confirming what you're saying, very good grade in single coverage when, when he is one-on-one. So perhaps a, a sleeper that, that, in the draft. That's, that's, you know, again – you know, dropping into a zone or midpointing like, you know, oh, the guy in the flat and the 20-yard out route, wait, I got to play in the middle here, right? You know, again, those are things to me through my experience that are coachable. You don't always need the most super talented guy. And again, I, I do want to make it sure that I'm clear. I like those Alabama guys. I'm just a little bit of a sucker for those man-to-man, pure cover corner guys. And yeah, I really like DJ James. He was one of the the surprises of the evaluation for me. That's why you don't like Cooper DeGene and don't have him in the top five because Iowa just plays zone all day and every <laughs> Iowa – all my notes on Iowa corners for the last seven years like knows how to play zone, good route recognition, that's what they do. Do you do you guys – and and again, I don't know exactly where you stand on this, but like I like Cooper DeGene a lot like I'm talking about with the Alabama guys. I don't know if I feel like he can play corner. That would be my biggest concern. I kind of look at him and think I feel like it's more Eric Weddle than I feel like NFL corner, right? Weddle, maybe a certain situations, he's down there as the nickel guy because he will tackle and do all that too, but that hybrid nickel safety type of guy. But, man, I don't think I could trust Cooper DeGene on the with some of his change of direction movements and his, his ability to stick the foot in the ground and close on defenders. That was less than to me in those those type of situations to where I, I kind of feel like he's a more of a, a safety than I do a cover corner. It's funny because, like, you know, people are posting these clips of his basketball highlights and all that kind of stuff. Like, and, and when he finally got cleared, obviously he run the 40, he did the jumps, which are the sort of straight line ver- uh, explosive stuff, and those are all good. So you put those two together, and it's like he's a top-tier athlete. He can play number one corner. He lo- he's an elite athlete. And I, I agree with you. The tape to me didn't show that, but I don't have any proof. I don't. I can't because right. he didn't run the change of direction <laughs> right, right. stuff. So I can't. I can't prove that I'm like I'm seeing what's actually there versus like yeah. I'm just inventing it. And actually, he is an elite change of direction athlete. But I agree. I, I his 
his footwork, look, I mean, part of it, I think, may have been, I think I watched him in pretty close proximity to Terry and Arnold. And, like, the two, those are not the same no, level of change no. of direction right. athlete. Right, exactly. Terry has got great feet. He's got loose, greasy hips. He can change direction everywhere. My only problem with Terry on Arnold is just I wish he was a hair faster, right, to be that pure cover corner. But, man, like, you're right, Sam. Everything else is like, whoa, that's great. Right. Yeah, DeGene is a little bit stiff that way. And, like, yeah, I wish we had a Big Ten, you know, contract and we could show plays and go, wait, the hell with it. We don't have proof. Look at these seven <laughs> plays and look yeah. how he kind of comes out of this break or adjusts when this guy does this route. That's not what a top cover corner looks like. So, good player. Another one where I'd go, damn, I want him on my defense, but I just – I don't want him on an island against Jamar Chase. That's for right. sure. And that's where, you know, usually my thoughts start when you talk about cover corner. P people don't realize how difficult it is to get film rights. I mean, you're sitting there at NBC hosting <laughs> right. the biggest game of the week and now host uh, Big Ten Saturday Night, Saturday Night Football, and you can't get Cooper DeGene film over there at NBC. <laughs> it is it is I know. crazy. Yeah, we we got a limited capacity now that at least we have the Big Ten deal. We can show some of those guys. All right, we'll let you – I know you got more film to watch. We'll let you out of here. One more um, – Two All quick, right, all good. Quick questions to touch on here. Talise Fuaga, uh, tackle from Oregon State. Did you list him as a guard? Is that what I'm? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Now, like, I, I he could play tackle, right? I, him and and the, the Washington kid certainly both can play tackle. I just think they fit better at guard. I mean, the Oregon State kid. I I mean, you know, I mean, you talk about explosive off the ball, moving people on contact, dominating them. He is a road grader, right? So I love Fuwaga, right? And I, and I, you know, again, even in the tackle, I'd be like, hey, take, I am a tackle. I'm okay with that. I just look at him and go, I think he could be like Zach Martin or Quentin Nelson in a hurry at guard. That's what I really loved about him. Incredible athlete, you know, great feet. I didn't love his anchor, I think, as a pass pro guy at tackle, right? That maybe worried me a little bit. But definitely a guy that I think could do either one. I just think he'd be best at guard. Who, who's your top tackle? Is it Alt? No, I actually like Latham. Latham, Latham from oh, Alabama. Oh, that's right. I did see right? that. Right? JC yeah, it, it's those yeah. two. I Listen, I understand Alt's film is cleaner. Again, all, I like Alt a lot. I think I look at it and just go, like, Alt is McGlinchey or Taylor Decker. And I kind of see that being the ceiling, which is really good. Don't get me wrong. We know. I mean, that's good every year. I'll take it. But I look at Latham, Latham from Alabama where you watch him at the end of the year and you watch, you know, Georgia and the Auburn game and Michigan, and I want to go, nobody can move the guy an inch. I mean, he's got great feet. He moves people in the run game. I guess I just look at it and go, yeah, he's not quite as polished as Alt is. But it's not so far beneath that I don't think the talent, the size, the potential of him. I kind of liked him a little bit more than Joe Wall, uh, but not a ton more. But uh, but the, damn, I thought both of those guys were really damn good. Go watch those films, Sam. J.C. Latham at Alabama. Go watch those last couple games. Yeah, yeah. Is... I mean, really, there's something, and I like that about him too because early in the year. You'd see, like, you guys will appreciate this because you watch film. You see mistakes, right? You see a wrong angle to the second level. You know, you see some sloppiness and technique. But what I loved about it was as the year went on, you saw real improvements. And then you saw those mistakes that were messed up early in the year. And you go, nobody gets by him in the second level now. Nobody moves him pass protecting. He's in a good position every time. And, of course, he's 346 with a big ass and big legs and long arms. <laughs> And we know that translates to the NFL, so we'll, we'll see where it goes. But, Sam, I think you will like it at the end of the year. Chris, you need to – do you write up these scouting reports? Can you release your notes, please? Because you've got, like, greasy hips for Terry and Arnold. You've got some good nuggets in there. I that do. I, think... I write up all my notes, right? Yeah. So I'm an old school oh, – wow. right? There's Marvin Harrison Jr. I'm afraid to release them because I do write some things in there that might get me <laughs> – no, Fired, just okay, release, so. just release it all. That's I'm a big hard copy guy too. This is my draft model right here. All 
uh, laminated, laminated, all, all professional. Where everybody's going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You're beautiful. PMF. You guys are big time. You're in the studio. <laughs> I'm just writing notes and you know. Oh doing yeah, that. you're <laughs> you're not in the studio. We that's where we did that studio is where we did our first ever draft show back yeah, in 2015. Yeah. Right there. Back in yeah yeah that's right. I, I you know what somebody told me that the other day. I'm actually in my home little office right now, uh, so oh, okay. you know, I just got a, a fake screen behind me, the Sunday night football fake screen working there. Oh, that's pretty cool. We don't see, we don't have that. We need that. <laughs> Do you have any other super hot draft takes that you want to drop before we let you go? Gosh, I don't know if, you know, I don't have any other takes that I think I look at, you know, I, we talked about my quarterback rankings. I, I do love all these quarterbacks, the other five other than May, right? I look at them all and go, I think they're all starting quarterbacks. I think they all know how to play the position. I'm very excited about that, right? And a lot of years when I get to like three, four, and five, I'm like, yeah, this guy's good, but gosh, he's a fourth rounder and he's a career backup. This was a year I was like, damn, number four is like an NFL starting quarterback, like for sure, right? So I like McCarthy. I think people are sleeping on Penix and Bo Nix to a degree. Um, I don't know. The other thing is, I don't think a running back's going until at least round three. And I want to know if I think a, is a linebacker going in the first two rounds, a stand-up linebacker. Those would be two things that I look at right now to go, I'm not sure if we'll see a running back or a linebacker in the first 60 picks. Uh, if there is, I don't think it'll be a lot of guys, that's for sure. Did, what? Uh, did you see Bo Nix at all at Auburn? Did you go back and watch any of his Auburn tape before Oregon? I, I did not. I did not go back to Bo Nix at Auburn. I, I kept it strictly to Oregon. But yeah, so why 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 are you asking that? He he looked like a completely different player. And from your yeah. experience, I feel like I, it was almost like stylistically he went from Jay Cutler to Alex Smith, right? Stylistically, like he was Auburn, he was freewheeling all over the place, and then in Oregon, it's just like boom, 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 get rid of the ball, take care of it. Looks like two completely different players. I don't remember a college player, you know, making that type of transformation. I don't know if that rings a bell with anybody for you, ch changing their style that much. No, it, it's, it's, it is drastic, right? You know, I think that's where coaching and having an offense is important, right? Having a, like, like this is what I do. I got to do this, okay? A checklist. Somebody lays it out there in front of you. He caught my eye at Auburn, right? He was a guy that, like, my dad and I used to go, like, hey, this is Bo Nix. Right, he's a good little athlete. The ball comes out of his hands, right? And then I think he polished, fine-tuned some things, certainly at Oregon. And now I feel like he's getting a little bit of a bad deal because they throw a lot of screens in the offense, right? And I want to go, he can throw the ball down the field and make big throws. It's not his fault that the offense, the screen game was a big part of it. They don't run the ball. And I feel like that's being used against them and uh, – you know, I don't know if that's totally a fair assessment. I understand it, but I don't think it's totally fair. What do you think of uh, Spencer Rattler's ceiling? He's everybody's favorite sleeper quarterback in this draft. I, I, I can understand that, right? You know, I think Spencer Rattler has some attributes to where you go, okay, maybe he could be a starter one day, but at the very like, at the very least, I think he could be a long-time backup. You know, he's played some football. You know, he can make all throws. He's got a little – he's got a few clubs in the bag as far as, you know, different types of throws. And, you know, like his combine workout wasn't all that great. But when you watch him on film, man, he's got a little more power in his arm than I thought he did, right? He knows how to play the position. I, I do like him. And I would think after that top six, right, he is certainly one of the first guys off the board, you know, after the, the main guys. Right. All right, Chris. Well, uh, what are you doing anything on draft night? Tell everybody where you're going to be, where they can hear everything you're working on. Yeah, well, we're, we're that's to be determined. We have done like, you know, like in the barn live show for the draft in my house. I did it last year for the first time, right? And I did some drinky drinking and some smoky smoky <laughs> before I did it and really just embraced it and had some fun. We might do that again. The hard thing is is I got to get up at 5.30 the next morning and then do a live TV show with that jerk Florio who you guys know about, right? So I remember last year I was like, wait, I didn't go to bed till like 2-something. I woke up. I was like, am I going to do that to myself again? I'm not sure, but you know me. I'll be at NBC Sports following everything, all over thing. Chris Sims Unbuttoned Podcast and Pro Football Talk with Florio is where you'll find me. Since, since you mentioned it, is Florio as much as a, of a jerk as he seems? on twitter oh, definitely okay. definitely yes yes <laughs> just he's, he's sure. one of my favorite jerks though he's my yeah. best buddy i'll say that he's one of my best buddy but yes he is a jerk there's no doubt he about likes it. To, he likes to <laughs> poke and 
Pick some fights. Oh, he's he's yes, he's the ultimate poker. He pokes me. He pokes everybody. He's a conspiracy theorist, yeah. right? He's got a lot of issues. As I tell him all the time, he needs to lay on the couch and talk to a psychologist in the worst way. But we, we make it work some somehow, some way. <laughs> well, Chris, I'll tell you this. It's one of our favorite shows of the year. Love hearing your takes. And, uh, again, I think everybody who doesn't already do it, I mentioned this to you off air, we have a lot of crossover. A lot of people, I think, listen to both of us. They like the crossover episodes. But if you're not doing it already, go check out the Unbuttoned podcast with, uh, with Chris Sims. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Always good talking to you. Hope you're well. Enjoy the weekend, all right? Thanks, you Thanks. too. You too. See you guys. Peace out. Yep. Yeah. All right, Chris Sims. Always, I do enjoy having Chris on. Yeah, like, you know, there are people that rail against that because his takes are sort of so out there. They're like, you know, stop giving this guy a platform. Stop publicizing this craziness. Like, number one, he does believe it. Like, he justifies. It's not, he isn't Skip Bayless. You know what I mean? He's yes. not just putting out crap out there because he knows it'll do clicks. This is what he thinks, and he can justify it. Now, you might disagree with it. I think he's way off on Brian Thomas Jr., but he's not alone. Like, there are other people out there. Greg Rosenthal, friend of the show, tweeted yesterday, the one draft take that he has so far is you can't draft Brian Thomas Jr. high enough, right? Like really? Yeah. I saw, so, I saw a, you, um, you said, so, you were, I saw you respond to him, yeah. and I couldn't find the tweet right. that it was. So... You know, he's not alone. Number one, he's not alone with that. And now he might be alone saying Thomas is above uh, Marvin Harrison. But the point being, him being super high on him is not out there on an island. But the other point being, he can justify it, right? You hear him talk through his rankings, whatever they are, and you go, okay, there's logic behind it. I might disagree. I might think he's nuts. But I, I respect... Like, we've been complaining that everyone has the same rankings, right? This draft period, yeah. everyone seems to be in the same area. The consensus is really strong this year. And over there is Chris Sims being like, Brian Thomas is better than Marvin Harrison, and this guy that's 120th on the big board at corner is the top three guy, right? I like that, and I like that he's willing to come on, talk it through, articulate his reasons. Yeah, I completely agree. And by the way, we're not going to have anyone on the show who is literally just a hot take artist that doesn't that doesn't mesh with what we do that's not on brand right we're gonna we're gonna talk to people like jt o'sullivan like chris sims people that do the work and they might come to different conclusions which is better i'll say this i mean i i try to sit in a vacuum and and not get the outside forces like i don't listen like i don't listen to chris's podcast because i don't want to be influenced by NFL takes if, from anyone else. I don't listen to anyone else in the season so that everything that I say is completely my own take as much as possible. Right. And it's basically what he's doing is just saying, I'm just watching the film, I'm writing my notes, and I'll give you my rankings. I have no idea what other people are doing. If I believe that his rankings were there specifically for clickbait, right? If he was Skip Bayless, we wouldn't have him on the show because I'm not interested in here's just our, here's, here's artificial you know, takes. Here's artificial hot takes. Here's artificial drama. But I am interested in talking to people who see the rankings, see the players differently than we do, right? In fact, I'm more interested in talking to them than bringing on someone who sees it exactly the same way as we do and saying, hey, we've been saying this already. Why don't you say it again in a different way? Yeah. It makes more sense to talk to somebody like uh, Chris Sims and say, okay, I think you're nuts with the Brian Thomas thing. Explain to me why you're seeing it that way. Um, and we're going to have other people on later that, that see like almost the opposite way of Chris Sims at certain positions, right? I think those are good discussions to have. And, you know, people need to listen to them rather than just going, I hate his ranking, so I'm not tuning in. Yeah, the one last thing, you know, as I tweeted out that, hey, we're going to have Chris Sims on and somebody, somebody posted his quarterback rankings from 2021 that had Zach Wilson 1 and Trevor right. Lawrence 2. And it's like, okay... As he said, I mean, he mentioned it himself, especially yeah. quarterbacks. Everyone missed. I, I urge everyone, find the person for me. A couple people suggested a few, you know, internet sensations or whoever. Find me the person that exists that had all the quarterback rankings right for the last six or seven years, especially the last six or seven years. Right. I mean, right. for a while, it was Sims. Sims yeah. was the guy. He was the was guy. Saying, for, oh, you might hate his rankings. He was but higher look, on Herbert, yeah. higher on Josh Allen. He was higher on Lamar Jackson than everybody. Right. He had one blip with Zach Wilson. There were a few years, though, where everyone was pointing to his rankings and saying, Sims is the guy. Sims like, never he's misses. He's the best right. quarterback evaluator out there. And then one, one Zach Wilson over Trevor Lawrence, and that's all anyone remembers. And it, like, overall, his hit rate has been good. There was like one, Kellen Mond was crazy, and Zach right. Wilson. I mean, in hindsight, right? <laughs> we may have said Kellen Mond at the time. He had him at four. 
But he had Zach Wilson over Trevor Lawrence. He had right. Kellen Mond at four. But the point being, everyone, those were the only two egregious misses, misses I think, over the last few right. years. But the point is, everyone misses. Of course, everyone misses, and everyone misses at every position. Right? The 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 entertainment value in this is hearing the conversations. It's not your rankings were better than our rankings. Ours were better than yours. Like it's not a points tallying exercise. It's Let's talk about these players that are about to enter the NFL that we're going to watch for the next X number of years or that your team is going to draft or somebody else's team is going to draft. It's the conversation, right? And the more diversity of opinion there is in that, the better the conversation. Well, all right, I'm going to get to something in a minute here. Uh, but first, it's important to me that supplements that I take are of the highest quality, and that's why for the last few years we've been, dr- we've been drinking AG1 here on the PFF NFL Podcast. Unlike many supplement brands, AG1 conducts relentless testing to set the standard for purity and potency. AG1 is constantly searching for how to do things better at 52 iterations of their formula and counting. Their team is always trying to find better ways to source, test, and aim to find the best quality ingredients available. It's researched and developed by an in-house team of scientists, doctors, and nutritionists with decades of experience in their respective fields. So many people have asked me if AG1 is actually the real deal, and trust me, there's a reason why we've been drinking it for so long. Quality for AG1 isn't just a buzzword. It's a commitment backed by expert-led scientific research, high-quality ingredients, industry-leading manufacturing, and rigorous testing. At each step of the uh, process, AG1 goes above and beyond industry standards. So we've partnered for AG1 for so long because they make such a high quality product that we genuinely look forward to drinking every single day. So if you want to replace your multivitamin and more, you start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first subscription over at drinkag1.com slash PFF. That's drinkag1.com slash PFF. Go check it out right now. Did you see the breaking news? OJ? O.J. Simpson has passed away. Mm -hmm. Any uh, other thoughts? There's not much you could say. I don't know what you can really say about O.J. Simpson. Wrapping up the man's life and legacy. It's not an easy one in a couple of minutes. Yeah, there was a lot there. He was a great football player, of course, accused of uh, murdering his ex-wife and her boyfriend. Was acquitted. Most people don't believe that. (laughs) Acquitted criminally, found guilty of... Uh, in, a, in a civil court, right, was had to give up millions for years. Then, uh, <laughs> like, continued like, to be complicated. Yeah, robbed his own, robbed somebody of it to, to get back his own memorabilia. Set up like it was was effe- effectively a late like late life grifter to just keep earning money and keep away from the amount that he owed the civil people. Very complicated legacy, and of course, star of the Naked Gun movies. Yeah, before Nordberg. before all of that. May have been his finest work. Were you uh were you watching live during the the White Bronco chase in Ireland? No. Would you have seen that? No. Or were you in the States at that point? No. I was uh I had a almost certainly wasn't televised in Ireland back when I was having a sleepover with some friends, twelve year old me. Yeah. And we were watching Ace Ventura. I believe. They break in Ace remember. Ventura for the Bronco chase? I mean, we had rented it at Blockbuster. Oh, okay. You know, went to Blockbuster. Rented it at Blockbuster. You get Ace Ventura. You have a fun night watching Ace. And then, I, I you know, my parents are like, oh, you know, this thing, you know, the football player's running away or something like that. You know, yeah, we get to watch. Yeah. So that's where we were. You don't get that anymore, you know? This whole world of digital, you know, Twitter and stuff. They would be on Twitter, I guess. It wouldn't be, nobody would be watching the TV. For the OJ chase, yeah. if it happened today, the kids don't understand the uh, the trip. Do you have Blockbuster? Yeah, oh yeah. in Ireland. We had, so we had we had Blockbuster, which was the big multinational chain. But yeah. Then there was Extra Vision, which was like the Irish Blockbuster. I see. So those were like rivals. I mean, we there was a bunch of like the local chains that we would go to. But you know, a, a typical a typical night with my friends would be like we're going to go to Blockbuster and you know scour either for a video game to play and try to beat that night or a movie to watch whatever it might be maybe both you jason, never know. jason in the chat points out that if that happened today oj would be live streaming it on tiktok which is 100 <laughs> percent true i'm in the back there would be a live stream coming from the bronco of oh oj's chase could you imagine um anyway anything else as far as i hate hearing sims talk about may like that because i want to like drake may but so this is it, it is it's really interesting to me now because I still feel like it might be going too far, but the overall sentiment I think is correct. Like my first sort of feeling 
because I had, you know, I try and do it a bit like you in terms of coming to these guys initially from a vacuum, from a blank sheet. But I'd heard enough about Drake May to know that he was supposed to be 1A with Caleb Williams and an, an elite prospect. And I'd, you know, seen him just, there's Drake May, right? Looks yeah. like a quarterback prospect that's elite. And then you put on the tape and you're like, it's exactly like that meme. If he's such a good hitter, why doesn't he hit good? Like, if he's such a great prospect, why isn't this tape good? It's not exactly like that. We're it talking is, though. back-to-back years of high 80s, 90, uh, 90 PF. Right, but then you turn on the tape, and you're like, why are there so many crappy throws a lot for of a guy that's this there. good? Yeah. I get it. I get it. But there's a lot of special there, but, too. So, so we're, we're going to. We're going to get Nate Tice on the show yes, next week. He has opposite. Drake May as QB1. And has from the outset. And he will he will balance balance out the tape. Yeah, but so my, my, my point being, initially, I think the correction – if that's where he was to begin with, is correct. Is, is to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's not in the same stratosphere as Caleb Williams. He really isn't. There's a lot. The difference between their two, tape, two tapes, I think, is stark. Um, so we should start focusing on the negatives of Drake May. But then I feel like it just took on a life of its own, and now it's like the whole cottage industry is just shitting on Drake May. Whereas, realistically, you can say, okay, look, there's some concerns, and he misses too many throws and stuff, but... He's not that bad, and the tools are immense. Like, let's let's not go overboard here. And I think, you know, with respect to Chris, who justified his take, and I think he's going a bit overboard. I think there's the absolutely reason to separate him from Caleb Williams. I'm not sure there's reason to put him QB6 and say, like, we're talking about a project here. Um, someone pointed out that on yesterday's show, which, again, you should go back and check out Mailbag, and we just, we just talk ball, man. It was great. I don't even know what the topic was, but it's just so I, – I enjoy just – talking about the draft and what's going on and that was our Wednesday show but one of the emailers I guess was from uh, John Olrude's helmet yes it was a, twi- it was and a Twitter and somebody question. tweeted at me that I did not explain what that means do you know what that means do you know what, do you know what that is do you know what that reference is no I don't you don't know who John Olrood is don't have a clue former major league player don't care either if that helps former major league first baseman yeah and because he had um, some sort of early life brain issue when he played in the field, he had to wear a helmet. Okay. So John o- Olerud always wore an ear flapless helmet, flapless helmet in the field. He was the only player who ever wore a helmet in the field rather than just a regular hat. Like a bicycle helmet? No, just like a, like a baseball helmet, but without the ear flaps. Which Not a bicycle up, helmet. Which ends up looking like a bicycle looks helmet. Looks nothing like a bicycle helmet. There's no strap that's not, it's just, it looks nothing like it whatsoever. It has a... But the lack of the ear thing, the thing that br- differentiates a that's baseball the only helmet part. is the ear head. It's the only the part. Ear- um, by the way, major league players used to wear helmets with no ear flaps. Yeah. Then they started getting hit there, and, and they, they, started, they added an ear, ear flap. Then they added the chin guard for a lot of them. But Olerud, such a good hitter, didn't play a day in the minors before going to the big leagues. Straight from Michigan, um, I think he had his first day in the minors in like year fifteen or something like that of his career. He got in like a rehab assignment, went right to the big leagues, flirted with hitting four hundred. There he is. There's the helmet, like a bike helmet, just like that. Yeah. Flirted with hitting 400 yeah. in, uh, in 1993. I think he landed at 363. Cool. Off the top of my head. head. There's also another funny story. You know Ricky Henderson? <laughs> yeah, I do, actually. You know, stolen base man. You know, stolen base guy. See, I know. Supposedly, if this is true, Ricky's with Olerud with the Mets, and he says, hey, hey, man, I used to play with a guy that wore a helmet in the field. And John said, yeah, Ricky, that was me in Toronto. Eight years ago. Because uh, Ricky, you know, didn't see the you know, um, miss some stuff. While we're going down tangents. Uh, yeah, that's what we're doing. Because we're only at like an hour-long show. What right. else are we going to do? The helmet of the year thing? There are few pains in this lifetime worse than the pain of getting smacked in the ear with something sharp or heavy or hard. Yeah. Right? I, one time, uh, you, know, like, you, you know, sometimes in football practice, you see people with... Uh, no pads but with a helmet but you don't tend to see it the other way around right pads but without a helmet Mm. because the pads are hard and if you fall and your head without a helmet on it cracks into the pads it's ear skull pad insanely painful like genuinely one of the most painful things that's ever happened to me you're like from that moment on okay this is why helmet ear protection can't have ear hitting shoulder pad that hurts a lot See, that's the type of information we need here. This is the thing you don't get, you know? This is, this, these are the lifetime experiences that people need. Uh, stop. Just stop. 
generally with uh, telling us, oh, you know, Sims missed on a guy. I don't want to hear it. Everybody missed. I don't want to hear Everybody missed. There's nobody. Nobody is out there. Come at a thousand. It with the right baseline. It's uh, not. I mean, look, if you're if you're. If your exercise is out there, if your goal in all of this, the pre-draft process, right? If you, if your consumption of pre-draft content is about who is the most accurate forecaster out there, I am only listening to him. You can go find that person. Arif Hassan, you know, tabulates it all with his giant consensus boards and tracks it going back to 2016 or whatever. You can go and find the most accurate uh, talent evaluator out there and only focus on what that guy says. Now, number one, that guy misses a lot, right? Because nobody is batting, you know, a thousand. Nobody's batting 50%. So the most accurate guy you can find on the internet Hold is on. still crappy at this, right? Yeah, uh, I don't have my, I don't have my model results here handy. Yeah. Is this it? No, that's outdated. So number one, Go do that if, you, if that's the way you want to get down. But, but be aware that that guy is pretty bad at it as well. Like he's still a 50-50 shot, if that. So the point in all this is to have discussions about these players. And the more people you listen to, the more interesting, the more nuanced, the more color you get on a given guy. This is the point. It's let's talk about these players, not yeah. here's our ranking and we're better than everybody else out there. It's here's our ranking. Except for the model. Make of it what you will. Obviously, the model is perfect. But, you know, this is our ranking because people like rankings, not this is our rankings. Therefore, everybody else is full of shit. The model's not perfect. But I compare it for non-quarterbacks only because, you know, it's, it's very good compared to the baseline. You got to know what the baseline is. Right. By the way, one thing occurred yeah, to me. Turn that off. Ugh, yeah. Although I, I turned it the wrong way. almost deafened myself. Uh, shout out to Stopsky. Um, one thing that occurred to me while we were talking to Chris, but felt like too much of a tangent to go down. Smart. The, the Brian Thomas conversation feels a little bit like a, a carry on from the Keon Coleman discussion we had the other day and bring Zay Flowers into it as well. Just how important landing spot and situation and the right coaching staff is to a lot of receivers, not all of them. Yeah. And this is where I think, one of the reasons I think he's wrong about Brian Thomas over Harrison is I, there's no offense. All 32 teams, you could drop Marvin Harrison on that roster and they're better. And he's good, right? There's not a single landing spot in the NFL where Marvin Harrison doesn't look really good right out of the gate, right? I don't think that's true for Brian Thomas. I don't think that's true for Keon Coleman. I don't think that's true for Zay Flowers a year ago. And you're sort of looking, the things that Chris was talking about with Brian Thomas, his strengths... You're like, there's definitely a team, in fact, there's a few of them, where you put him on there and it, like, he, they can play to those strengths. They can ask him to do only what he's good at. If he can't do some of the other things, it doesn't matter. We can make that work. Like last year, I'm still not convinced we were wrong about Zay Flowers, but immediately when he was drafted, we're like, he went to a great landing spot. Like for that's, sure. That's yeah. a perfect spot for him. And if you look at the way they used him, they played in. Like, what does Zay do well? That's what he's going to do for us. What does he not do well? We're not going to do an awful lot of that. So my back of a, you know, my nutshell analysis of Zay Flowers a year ago was he reminds me of like, of um, Dante Hall, the Chiefs wide receiver slash return man adjusted for inflation, right? Which isn't to say that's useless, but it is to say you need to make, you need to play to that. You need to turn him into that guy and feed him the ball in those situations in a way that wasn't really possible back when Dante Hall was playing. And they did. They made him a high target, high volume guy doing all those types of plays and didn't ask him to do an awful lot of anything else. So he landed in the perfect spot to look good. But if he landed somewhere else and they were like, no, we need you to be our number one guy because we have a crappy receiver room. Like if he landed at Carolina and he had the Jonathan Mingo treatment where they're like, I understand you might be better as a big slot, but we don't have a number one receiver, so you're it right now. He, would he have looked good at all? Probably not. Who was the last person you said? If Zay Flowers had had the Jonathan oh, you, Mingo treatment. Oh, right? Mingo, yeah, yeah. And he said, look, you might be best in the NFL as a big right. slot guy, no, I heard we, I but we don't have it. a number one, so you're it right now. Right. What would Zay Flowers have looked like as a rookie? Worse than he looked in Baltimore. Again, this, this applies more for receiver and cornerback, I think, than any other position. Sure. Because you can nitpick 
and you can pull out the best of a guy's skill set and plop him into a specific role where you can't do that for tackles. Uh, you can kind of do that for edge rushers, but you don't want to do that in the first round. You can kind of do that for defensive tackles, but again, you don't want to do that in the first round. You can get away with that at receiver because there's three or four legitimate starters at receiver who play a lot. And if Zay Flowers, like nobody was looking at Zay Flowers and be like, man, he didn't do enough wide receiver one type stuff. He didn't do enough winning on the outside and winning vertically and winning at the intermediate route. They were like, no, you played to a skill set great. And he had a, he had a very good season because, and, and that's worthwhile in the first round. So receiver, and we said that about Brian Thomas Jr. I, I don't trust him if you give him the Mingo treatment. Like you said, go be the number one. I love him as a two slash three deep threat go go create big plays right now while i think he's got to work on the route running and some of the other nuance of the position yeah um you can't do that at at other positions like the tackle that has to work on some of the nuances of the position has to be a starter play out play 900 snaps maybe have some bad seasons and then by year three maybe figure it out and that's part of why i think offensive linemen the guys who play they take three years to to improve and they they show the most improvement because they have a lot of on-the-job training where they can't be hid, right? Hidden. And um, they have to go out there and play. Sure. And, you know, so, like, okay. A year into their NFL careers, it's, I don't think you can necessarily take definitive victory laps over anything, right? So some of it is going to sound like we're just making excuses. Except Tyree Wilson. Yes. Some of it is going to sound like we're just making excuses for last year's takes. And to a degree, we will be. But I'm happy to say that I missed on several receivers last year. Completely missed on um, Puka Nakua. You actually had identified him as a guy that you liked lower down. I hadn't, right? So I'm, I didn't see that coming at all. Um, there were guys that I was higher on that haven't been good. But I'm not alone in saying Jonathan Mingo is not in the role last year that he's supposed to be in, right? Um, Matt Harmon, Reception Perception, points out that like Keon Coleman, like some of these other receivers – Mingo was in a completely different role last year than the role he should be, just according to his college statistical profile, right? So forget, does he look good or not? Like, he's being asked to do the things that he wasn't good at in college and isn't going to be good at in the NFL if he's going to be a player or not. So Mingo might stink, right? What what I'm saying is we don't know that after the first year because he's put in a role that is not what he's supposed to be doing, right? So that you can say that's making excuses for Mingo or not. I Right now it looks like I missed on Mingo, but it is worth pointing out that we don't know because he's not in the role he's supposed to be in. Um, what else was I... Oh, and the Zay Flowers thing, right? Like, again, I'm still not convinced our analysis was off on that. Like, this is the power of situation, is you can take a guy that might not be amazing in a, in a given... in in a vacuum, in a random system, in a random generic receiver spot, and you can make him look a lot better by playing to his strengths. Alternatively, you can take a guy who might be able to do some of that and make him look terrible by putting him in a situation that isn't what he's supposed to be doing. So, you know, again, everyone misses. The Mingo thing might end up being a miss, but until we see him actually doing what he's supposed to be doing, I'm not definitively declaring it so. All right, I want to give a little bit more perspective there, then we can wrap it up. Just uh, referencing the model here, you know, because I, I wanted to know if the model's good. Like, is this something I should actually be looking at? Is this something that NFL teams might actually uh, find valuable? So how would I go about testing that? So again, I've just looked at it and said, okay, what, what percentage of a position turns out to be a solid player or better? You know, I've explained this before, but it's what's that percentage? And so, say, for receivers, historically, all the receivers drafted are, you know, in UDFAs that have played significant time, 9% of them have been at this, using PFF war, 9% or better. And the model's at 30%. If you, just, if you just took 80th percentile models, made up a cutoff, 80th percentile or better, it's, it's 30. So it looks, like it's, it looks like it's better. You know, tackles, even better than that. 16% become solid. 42% become starters. But the models, 56% become solid, right? So more model players become solid or better starters by this number than become even just starters. And remember, a big chunk of starters are below average, right? That's, that's the nature of it, right? You're trying to find good players. So that's all you're trying to do is set some, some kind of baseline. And so that's why I would say with quarterbacks, it's even worse because the goal is not even to try to find a starter, right? 
was Tua Tonga Vailoa a hit? Yeah, by any other position he is, but we're even like we're even having this conversation if you want to give him a second contract. Now I think he'll get a second contract. I think he's a hit, but that's how difficult it is at the quarterback position and why it's so different because the the just the standards are so different there for what what you want. Just one more name to mention to prove that I am happy to take an L when an L is justified. The year before, so last year we're dealing with one season's worth of data. The year before, I loved Sky Moore. Sky Moore looks very bad in the NFL. Went and, to a good, he went to a good situation. Yes, that unlike help. these yeah. other receivers, some of whom you can point to the situation and say, okay, there's a, at the very minimum, there is a confounding factor involved here that means we cannot definitively say this guy is good or bad because the situation is not asking him to do what he's supposed to be doing. Sky Moore was put in exactly the situation that he was supposed to be in in order to thrive and has still looked terrible. That is one where not only am I wildly wrong on my analysis of Sky Moore, that's one where looking back, I don't even know why. Like sometimes you look back with hindsight and you're like, I was wrong on this and here's why, here's what I miss. That's one where I'm looking back, I'm like, I don't get why Sky Moore is as bad as he is in the NFL based off his college tape and the analysis. But again, just to prove, Perfectly happy to take a loss when a loss is there. I missed on Sky Moore. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. But just understand. Of course it does because people are like, ah, those guys always, you're just trying to defend your take. Don't respond to them. It's enough of them that it's worth bringing up. Anyway, we appreciate everybody for tuning in. We appreciate Chris joining the show. Always fun having him uh, join us. We're going to have a lot of interviews coming up soon. JT O'Sullivan, Dane Brugler on the show next week. We're trying to find Mike Renner on the golf course. We'll pull him off, you know, to – to join the show, Nate Tice on the show, Bruce Feldman. We have all sorts of people lined up to talk drafts. You don't just get to hear our takes. Same stuff over the next couple of weeks. We're going we're gonna to mix it up, have all sorts of different conversations here. So we appreciate everybody for tuning in here today, and we'll see you again on Monday with more PFF NFL Podcast.